I'm really excited to introduce uh, our next speaker, Steph Penner. He's on the core team, one of the most prolific. I think you just beat TJ for most commits on GitHub. Is that right? Over what period of time? Um, yeah, most. Uh, be I beat TJ on number of events on GitHub. Okay, that's insane. Which most prolific? Man, like the Ernest Hemingway of uh, JavaScript. <laughs> for better, for worse. For better, for worse. Well, I, and he was an alcoholic, wasn't he? So this is actually going to be an appropriate talk. Uh, Cool. Okay, anyway, step in, everyone. So I'm, I'm Steph, and I'm, I'm an addict. Um, yeah. You guys supposed to say, hi, Steph. Hi, Steph. Thanks. I need the support. So I was... It was like pretty cool. Like I saw this number and I was like, cool. I'm, I found a few people. And I was like, I'm catching up to them. It's pretty neat. Um, but then all of a sudden, everyone I saw I had surpassed, and I was a little bit worried. Like this is now a problem, maybe. Um, but luckily, um, I found this guy. So, um, well, 50 percent more GitHub events than me. I am just a hobbyist. So <laughs> there's there's no problem. So I'm also a husband with a very patient wife, <laughs> as you can imagine. We're crazy bird people. So for those of you that have remote paired with me, once in a while, one of my birds will join the pairing session. And uh, we're much more productive then, I think. Also, I work at Yap. Um, we build uh, an Ember. We build a lot of cool stuff. Some of which is some pretty cool Ember stuff. Um, I get to work with Luke and Chris and Ray, and uh, we do a combination of product work, sort of full stack work that involves a lot of Ember, and consulting work. Because we were early adopters and early adopters on the mobile platform, we had to do a lot of performance work and a lot of bug fixes to get it in. And because of this, we have like we have gained a little bit of knowledge in this domain. So if we can help you guys out, find me, Chris, or Luke afterwards. We would love to help you guys out. Anyways, also, I, I like talks that are a little bit more like a dialogue. A little bit of feedback from the audience is lovely. Um, so speak out, but be mindful. We have a really short window. And I'm going to try to finish a little bit early so we can answer questions. Um, and a little random tidbit about me. Um, in elementary school, my, my mother was the teacher at my elementary school. And so that meant two-hour detention, basically, every day for six years. Um, luckily, though, I didn't have a computer at home, but luckily, um, I had a computer labs, a computer labs. Basically, computers everywhere, and uh, ultimately, this turns into the child maintaining the school's website. Um, I wrote JavaScript, and I was like, you know, someday, when I grow up, it'd be pretty cool to learn a real language and build really awesome things. So <laughs> apparently, I didn't grow up, because I'm back to the, that. Anyway, so this Ember thing doesn't really need that much of an introduction, but basically our, our goal and motivation, the reason why we're all here is we want to build apps that are awesome. We want to build apps where we're productive and continue to be productive into the future. It's fancy, it's neat, abstractions save time, abstractions hide complexity. I'm basically just iterate, iterating all the past talks that we've had. Abstractions guide learning and collaboration. Abstractions enable cost sharing. I really like this one. This is my favorite one. We can basically load balance the cost of some of these hard things onto an entire community rather than every single company doing the same thing, spending the same resources. Yada, 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 yada. So, but ultimately, no matter how awesome and how productive Ember makes you, software is software. Them productivity sim sinkholes. So, when you start a new app, you're going to be productive. When you start a new Ember app, you're going to be productive. Everything is new. Everything is fancy and fantastic, and you haven't made any bad choices yet. Pretty, pretty quickly, your Ember app might turn into something like this. So <laughs> why does this happen? No matter how hard you try, all of a sudden, there's those parts of the code base. You're like, well, I don't want to look there anymore. Just throw it away. So basically, every line of code you write is actually a liability. You have to weigh the benefit, the cost-benefit ratio. I'm going to write some code. Um, 
but it's going to be around for a while. The life of the project might not just be a spike. It might be months, years. The code you write, be careful with what you write. It's, it can cost a lot later on. So, but Steph, I'm a programmer. I write code every day. This is what I get paid for. My employee won't pay me if I don't write code. Um, yeah, but you can probably write better code. Or what code can we kill? What, what code is basically just ripe for the picking? So basically, what is, what is the most brittle code, most error-prone code, the most pointless code we can just throw away, hide behind an abstraction, or just remove altogether? Let's pick on those things and kill them so we can focus on our domain. So one of those places is just glue code. Code that wires this up with that, assembles this, your app boot, the way your app's booted. So a few years ago, before we had Ember application, for those of you that remember this, um, you were responsible for putting things in the right places, wiring them up. Some people had dependency injection, some people didn't, but it was always your responsibility to do so. This is crazy. And why is this crazy? They're often implemented haphazardly. Often they make testing hard, makes refactoring hard, adding new features hard, because every time you're basically scenario solving, I need this to work today, and this just turns into a mess. Now, you also onboard new employees. They might have Ember experience, and they look at your app and they're like, yeah, I know Ember, I know what this is, but what is this app? Like, you're, this is entirely different from every other Ember application. And that's a, that's a big cost. Another cost is sort of scaffolding. It has n basically nothing to do with your actual project. It's the stuff that ultimately makes, lets you build your project and once you're ready, you don't need it anymore. Or it needs to be there, but it really isn't the primary part of your application. It turns out the support tooling is also immensely costly. Because, well, to go from development to production, you need to do all these things. And uh, Major Breakfast, who's uh, an active contributor as well, um, that's his, his drawing, so credit to him. And by the way, it has to also work really well, no bugs, has to be fast and stable, and your features due on Tuesday. So it turns out the, these two problems, they're like, they're actually very related. We can probably solve one with the other, or together, solving both of them, we're just gonna solve the opposite problem, or the complementing problem. So one of the first problems is just like general coupling. Obviously in Ember, our solution to this is inversion of control. We have a container, we have a dependency injection framework that most of the time, you don't even have to think about, it just kinda works. And when you do need to sort of peel away, it's there, and it's very powerful. The two main parts of this are the container and the resolver. The container basically abstracts the coupling and the resolver finds code for your container to use. I, <laughs> I even labeled, this is intentionally put here, I don't know why, but I did it. Um, another problem, it's, it's globals. To, to, to have coupling in your application that merely depends on the order that you load code is totally crazy, right? Now, you have a namespace, your namespace has a namespace, and like you're trying to organize your code, and all of a sudden, you can only start up your app in a very specific order, otherwise stuff's gonna break. This makes testing insanely hard, and again, it's a form of coupling. The solution, use modules. Uh, and what modules should we use? Well, let's not join the module war and just use what the language is going to have in the future, ES6 modules. And interestingly, combining these two things, a lot of that glue code just disappears because we can actually allow our apps to assemble themselves based on what's being imported, or what's being required. Um, as it turns out, we have this cool feature called the resolver uh, that Luke wrote. I don't think he realized how much mileage we would get out of, of this little bit of code, but it really powers some of our, our new code organization ideas. But basically, rather than you writing the glue code, your app builds itself as it's needed. Pretty, pretty cool. Code you don't have to write is not your liability. I originally had the GIF from yesterday, and I decided I shouldn't also have that GIF, so I found another one. So there's another problem, the whole tooling thing. We actually gotta ship these things to the browser. It's very different how we develop and how we have to ship to our clients. Um, so I already enumerated all of the million things we have to do to get tooling working, but obviously the, sol the solution is we need good quality tooling. But what do we build? We have to require some, we have to acquire some requirements. So 
What we do in Ember often is we find a cow path and we try to pave it. So rather than going straight to the Autobahn, can we like, can we create a cow path that everyone shares so we can turn it into a, or at least not everyone, but a critical mass of people, enough people share so we can learn all the constraints and also load balance some of the problem solving. Sort of an artificial way of us getting to the Autobahn quicker. So the idea with this was I need to ship real things. The node people are angry at us for using Ruby tools. Um, but I need to ship things. So Ember App Kit kind of happened. Um, I was doing a project for McGraw-Hill, and uh, one of the requirements was this is supposed to be consumed by the JavaScript community, so node build tools was the thing to do, so Ember App Kit happened. Since then, that was about nine months ago, we've had 572 commits, 71 contributors, and 519 closed issues. Um, that's not bad. Okay. Clearly, we have, created cow, we have created a cow path. People are using this, uh, being successful, being frustrated. I want to apologize to all the people that are frustrated. Um, I assure you, I am just as much frustrated, if not more, than the rest of you. So what's the problem with this? Upgrade nightmares. Who, hears, who here uses Ember App Kit? Okay, so we have enough, like there's a good number of people. Who here has upgraded an Ember App Kit app? Uh, who here's tried to upgrade an Ember app grid? And, okay, there we go, that's the uh, this is a nightmare. <laughs> and, and, and I feel very guilty, because I knew that this was gonna be terrible. Um, but the point of Ember app kit was just to figure out what all the constraints were. What do we actually need? And while doing so, what does Ember need to do to actually live in this no global space? So Ember app kit might look like a lot of work, but 90% of the work that Ember app kit has was actually in Ember, just supporting both the globals path and the modules path. This gave us a place to share the ideas to collaborate. So what's the solution for the upgrade nightmares? Let's hide more things behind a library. Let's hide the complexity. Well, copious bugs. Basically, using AppKit, <laughs> you add one new pipeline and all your other things breaks, or just core problems that happen. And well, the, the solution to this is a thorough test suite. Unfortunately, when your entire API is all of grunt, this test suite is very, very difficult to, to solve. Uh, Grunt is, I think, a, a pretty cool task runner. Um, we sort of shoehorned it into having more responsibilities than, than likely should have uh, happened. But you know, it, it kind of worked. Some people were productive with it. Another thing is uh, build stability. And the solution to this is basically using the right tool for the job. Doing a one-time build makes sense with a task runner. Doing repeated incremental builds that are efficient and not prone to errors, not prone to phantom files, or not detecting changes. This is the responsibility of a pipeline, a tool that's specially crafted only to solve these problems. And uh, for this, I think, I think Broccoli's a very good candidate. Thank you, Joe. Well, I, have, I have to, yeah. So Joe, Joe's done some awesome work on Broccoli, and uh, I remember in, November, I was playing with it, early version of Broccoli, and she's like, try to break it. So I was like, I can totally break it. I have like five or six steps that I, five or six different scenarios I know totally screw uh, with most build systems. Even some, uh, a rake pipeline has problems with them. And I threw all of them at it, and there was not a single problem. I was like, all right, but now let's try with 20,000 files. And even then, I still had fast builds. At that time, a build with 20,000 files was taking about a second, and no, uh, Joe traced it down to a problem in node glob, uh, not, not, not her stuff. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Even back then, it was very stable for this build thing, and sounds fantastic. So Ember CLI tries to solve these problems by giving us a single place to focus our energy, by using hopefully the right tools, by thoroughly testing itself, and trying to use the right abstractions. Whenever we find something in, in Ember AppKit that seemed to work okay, but clearly didn't work for everyone, taking the time and energy to take this and apply it to Ember AppKit, or apply it to Ember CLI, it's very important. So interestingly, um, although if we go back to the previous slide, Ember AppKit had about 500 or 600 commits, 70 co contributors, 500 closed issues in nine months, Ember CLI 
has, people are eager for this. It had already has 273 commits, probably more by now, 28 committers, contributors, and 131 close issues in the past month. So I think that, that's pretty cool that people are using it already. So another, another question here. Um, James Rosen, I'm gonna bug you for a little bit. What is, how big is your application? How big is Zendesk in file size? I'll, I would love an answer now. Act that. Okay. How many lines of code? Lots. It's a quick question is, can, do you ship all of this to your clients all at once? Oh, 70,000 lines of code, not 70 kilobytes. So 70,000 lines of code turns into much JavaScript and assets and templates and stuff. So can you ship all of this to your clients all at once? Okay. Yeah, so to summarize, because um, I'm assuming his voice might not be caught up on mic, um, Zendesk is 70,000 lines of code. Um, that is many, many hundreds, if not thousands of kilobytes. And it is not practical for them to ship their entire app to their users every time. So he has a group of people working on splitting this app into multiple bundles, shipping these bundles. Well, who, who else here has a similar problem where they can't actually ship their entire app all at once? One hand? Okay, there we go, there's a few more hands. This is actually a problem, and if you don't have that problem today, you're gonna have that problem probably pretty soon. Or you're gonna want to solve it, and then you think about all of the constraints. You're like, ah, I'm just not gonna bother, because I just really, my business can't afford me to spend a week, a month, refactoring my code, building the right tooling in order to ship these things lazily. I know Yahoo has similar, similar constraints for some of their projects they want to take, and, uh, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could kind of focus in one place to come up with a convention to make this not only simple to do, but to just make this work by default, work by convention, right? If, if, if you had this as just a thing that just worked, kind of like how URLs just work in the browser, you could lazy load your slash admin section. Who here wouldn't do that if they, well, either you're putting up your hands or not putting up your hands because you're not going to anyways. You wouldn't do that? You would do that? Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I gave a very bad question. Um, I think it's obvious. If these things were free, if these things were supported and worked well and there was a happy path to doing it, more people would definitely do it. I know I would use it a lot. So if you guys wanna try it out, you have internet today. Um, if you npm-g install ember-cli and then wait for npm to download on our um, wait for all the d dependencies to download on our conference Wi-Fi, you will eventually be prompted with something like this. So you have an Ember command line utility, inspired a lot by the project Ryan Florence worked on, Ember Tools. Ember Help gives you sort of the basic primitives of what you will likely need to build an Ember application. New Scaffold's a very basic application for you to use. You jump in and hopefully you can be productive right away. So Edward Faulkner did his, uh, just talk with it, and you seem to, seem to be happy, so that's a, that's a very good sign. Um, it was Greenfield Euphoria, so it's very important for us to make sure we can continue to pull that Greenfield Euphoria with us for as long as we possibly can before we end up ultimately ending up with legacy software of some kind. An interesting thing that we want to do here, and I would love to sort of get a show of hands as well, is we want an easy way for you to upgrade to Ember when we push releases. So we've been working very hard as the core team and the community on making sure that we, we don't break changes. We try very hard not to have any breaking changes. So one sort of experimental feature we want to add to the Ember CLI is just your ability to subscribe to the branch or the, the channel of Ember that you're most comfortable with. So for example, if you're more comfortable with stable releases, you can subscribe to stable releases. And if you happen to start up Ember CLI that day and we push a new release, it'll ask you, hey, yes or no? Do you want to try to upgrade today? And yes, and, and if our Semver stuff is all working, your upgrade followed by running your test suite should give you some confidence. And if there's a problem, report the problem, roll back, and hope that was five minutes of your morning. We'll get all the issues in quickly 
sort them out, and move on. If you are, like myself, always on the bleeding edge of things, I'll just subscribe to Canary, and basically every commit, will, I will have the option to pull it down and, and utilize it. So who here thinks that this is a thing that they would like to use in their projects? That's awesome. Um, so, so some crazier ideas that have been cropping up is, um, what if Bauer and Yeoman have a really cool library that they use called Insight, which actually lets us track analytics, usage patterns inside of command line utilities. So as an experimental thing, we've added this to the Ember CLI. Now obviously some people work in places where this is not an option. So the first time you use the CLI project, it prompts you, hey, would you like to submit anonymous information to help us understand your usage patterns? Um, so this is in there today. Um, can I get, I want to feel for like, who thinks this is a good idea? Who feels comfortable with this? And who uh, would feel comfortable with this if their employer felt comfortable with this? Awesome. Uh, another step onto that is, um, I would love to add, I would love to treat Ember CLI like a actual project that I deploy, which means bug tracking. So if, if Ember CLI crashes, the core team wants to see a bug report of this. I'm assuming this goes along the same lines. You guys would be fine with this. Oh, sure. People nodded, awesome. Um, that's, that's awesome. I, I was really hoping that that would be the case because this lets us catch problems quickly and maybe even before you report your bug, we might already know what happened and we'll be like eagerly waiting for your issue to be submitted. <laughs> um, awesome, that's, that's pretty cool. So a call to action. Um, Ember CLI is working for some people already. There's some pretty important features that we're still lacking. Uh, we added test support uh, early this morning. I'm not quite sure if we merged it in due to internet issues, but now we can run tests and stuff. This is very important for production applications. Uh, we're still missing a good fingerprinting strategy but uh, that's hopefully gonna be coming shortly. Um, but I would really encourage people to try it out, find bugs, anything that sucks, report it as a bug. If there's formatting that's screwed up, report it as a bug. If there's something that's confusing, report it as a bug, because we wanna pave these roads so that it's good for you guys and good for when you onboard new team members. Or if you're in an organization where you're fighting the Ember fight, please use Ember in the organization. Um, the better and cleaner this path can be, uh, the better, the easier it is for your arguments. Uh, I would also like to thank, so apparently all of the Ember CLI contributors are called Joe, um, or, or Broccoli people. So as it turns out, um, maybe not all of them, but a good number of them. So Joe Liz works on Broccoli. Uh, Joe Fiorini has been like amazing helping out with the Ember CLI project. It probably wouldn't be useful today if it wasn't for him. And it turns out Major Breakfast's actual name is Joseph. So once I realized that, I was like, so apparently Joes are good to work with. So if your name is Joe, you absolutely have to join because then we can just like, we can make a leaderboard of the number of jo Joes that are helping out. Uh, but even if your name isn't Joe, I would maybe more reluctantly accept some help. Um, best ways to help, like I said, install it, try your hardest to break it, look at the issues, see if there's an issue that's uh, related, add your story to it. Uh, and if you have some spare time, find an issue and see if you can improve it. I know Ed talked to me about uh, a layered build deployment approach. I think that's awesome, it's a fantastic idea. Works well, I think, with being able to deploy different segments of your application. Hopefully we can you know, continue to iterate upon it. So, if you can, give this a try, and hopefully, hopefully it works. And, Ember CLI is definitely not the, I didn't set out and decide, hey, I'm gonna write a, the awesomest CLI ever. I actually don't want to do this at all. I just want to build my app and be productive. I want to go Bower import um, Tom Huda fast select. And then in my application, I want to have a fast select component. I don't want to think about the wiring. I don't want to write code that is a liability to me. I also want us to share our components in a way that's easily digestible and easy to consume across different projects, across different teams, why? Because there's a room of like 430 people who are smarter than me here who can like build cool shit and we can share it. This is, this is the point of the CLI, is to not have to think about the CLI ever again. 
So for the future, I think Rails did something really neat later on in its life cycle. The first plug-in story for Rails was kind of SVN checkout into a vendor file, and it got them a long way. Um, I kind of feel like that's what we're at right now. We can SVN checkout, we can Bower install to your vendor, your Bower components folder. But wouldn't it be cool if you installed Bower install Ember off and it added generators to the CLI, it added extra routes to your router, added um, some test helpers, and then also added code that you can use in your application and assets and CSS. Well, I think this is possible. It's gonna take a lot of work just to iron out all of the various creases and stuff, but I think, I think we can do it. And once we have that, hopefully we can just start sharing these components and these utilities and these add-ons and, again, focus on our own app development rather than doing all this code that is actually just a liability to us. Uh, something I mentioned earlier was lazy loading of app segments. This is, I think this is actually very important for web applications. Uh, absolutely something we want to work on. And a uh, very important aspect of lazy loading that people don't think about is we have to be able to lazy link. You have to be able to link into things that don't actually exist yet. Something that we need to fix in Ember first before we can really use it here. But me and Alex sat down and figured out that there's no really big hurdles. We just gotta put in some time and effort to make it work. Also, finally, I, I wanna start using cool ES6 features in my apps today. So we can use modules today. We can use arrow functions today. I wanna start using generators today. For those that don't know what a generator what it will, basically, it'll help you, uh, one of the features of generators is it will help you hide asynchrony from your application, which is quite nice. Asynchrony in state is always hard to deal with. If we can hide it even more, that's fantastic. There's a whole bunch of other cool ES6 features that we want to use as soon as the transpilers and stuff are ready. Well, it'd be great if we could just add this to the same CLI so everyone can start utilizing these cool features. Anyways, so uh, hopefully that provides some context as to how we ended up with what we have today, and hopefully paves the road for what's next. Can I answer some questions? What happens to the Ember app kit? So the Ember app kit, everything that's in your app directory basically ports instantly. It just works. Things that don't work today that will likely work with a little bit of massaging is the index file. Oh, sorry. The question was, what happens with Ember app kit? Um, lots of those conventions about how your app assembles itself, uh, everything in app and everything in test, that should just continue to work, period. Unfortunately, stuff in your grunt tasks, custom configurations, those might be more difficult to port, but hopefully, as people share some of their concerns or share some of their issues, we can either have feature parity for some of those things or provide the correct upgrade path. Some of the features just aren't needed in Ember CLI anymore, and other ones are definitely still needed. Answer your question? Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, so the, the question is, do you have a preferred way to integrate with your server code? Um, I think there are, there are multiple approaches to this, but the easiest approach, one that I find works probably the best, is to keep your projects a little bit separate and have a proxy either on your server side or on your client side via the app kit or via the CLI that proxies those requests to your backend. Lots of people have their, their backend actually as a installed, as a deployed thing. Some people run it locally. I think this works fantastic. Um, so the question was, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the question was, what about globals? Most people here probably have applications that use globals. Um, so we were very careful when making all the upgrades to Ember to support non-globals to also support globals. Um, so Ember itself will continue to support globals just fine. Unfortunately, lots of the things that we just get for free in Ember AppKit or in Ember CLI is because we don't have globals. We don't have this coupling. I don't know if there's a good path for people other than to make a, a transition. Now, one thing that has worked, and we've helped a few clients upgrade this way, as well as our own code, is using the resolver. Remember, the resolver is the abstraction between the container, which needs code, and where it finds the code. We were able to write resolvers that satisfy both the global story and also the module story. So we were able to incrementally upgrade our application. We basically just added a warning every time a global was referenced and then we knew what the next thing was for us to upgrade. So my personal thing would be an upgrade path would probably yield um, the best later outcomes, although that's definitely not practical for massive applications. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, any, any other? So uh, this is kind of follow up to the question about sharing your front end back end code. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm actually sharing a whole bunch of modules that are really well to my main answer side. I'm using Browserify today. I'd love to eventually be on every CLI and stuff instead. Is there, is there any stories to that? So the question, I believe, is can I pull from node modules? Yeah. For my server side, node stuff, to, to load these same modules to, to share them. I, I would love there to be. I definitely need some. The question was, um, currently using Browserify, sharing node code, sharing JavaScript code between the back end and the front end is very simple. Um, is there a good story for this today? I would say there is not a good story for this today. It is a little bit frustrating. I would love there to be actually a really good story for this. Um, the browser five approach is definitely interesting. Um, we like the ES6 module stuff. We gotta figure out an interop that makes people happy or something different that makes people happy. I don't want to ever throw away things that work really well. Um, and I acknowledge that it's a really common use case. So the important thing is to figure out what that next step is. Uh, any, any other questions? Since this is just a hobby for you and you obviously have to go your time, one of the problems with having a job would be is that learning network in and of itself is, is a challenge, but then learning all of the tooling on top of it is really difficult. Can we get a screencast on network So the, 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 the statement followed by a question, was um, when, when people are learning Ember, they're learning a whole new paradigm. They're learning many things. Often they're coming from sort of spaghetti code cell front ends or just not used to building real user interfaces that have URLs and lots of state. Um, that's already complicated. Uh, Ember has a massive code base. There's a lot of stuff there. And now there's tooling. Well, is there a way for us to accelerate the learning process? and a screencast. <laughs> I would say, hopefully with the CLI, the scope of the tooling has reduced dramatically to specifically this. You can hopefully digest a good amount of this. I would like to port a lot of the guide that we have for Ember AppKit, remove the stuff that is no longer needed, and doing a screencast would be awesome if I have the time to do it. I would love to do a screencast. If someone else has the time to do a screencast, and has a much better like stage presence, voice thing going on, um, maybe like a Barry White style <laughs> screencast, that would be awesome. Uh, but ping me afterwards. Any other questions? I think we're, I think we're out of time. We got, we got 18 now. seconds. Oh no, you're right, we're going the other way. 20 <laughs> seconds, 21. <laughs> that was awesome stuff, thank you.